Hello everyone and welcome back to Agenite Talks where we talk about all things educational, professional and personal development. Now we're all taught to go to school, get a career and make money, but we're not taught how to manage this money. The information behind uh, managing your finances is much more important than you having the money to manage the finances mm. because I think even like it doesn't matter who you are, if you're a person maybe you live hand to mouth now, it's very important that you give your kids that information of how to handle money even if they don't have it yet. Mm. Because if they get to that age and now you know all they knew was the same lifestyle that you created for them, I mean not what you created for them but the lifestyle that you had as a result of your earning capacity, it's just the cycle continues yeah. and you don't want that. So the information is more important because you must have that information before you get the money. Behavioral finance is key. And in actual fact, in a country like South Africa, that's where we should start. Yeah. Before we even start dealing, I mean, yes, education is important, and parallel to dealing with the psychological effects of not having is very big. Welcome back to Agenite Talks, where we talk about all things educational, professional and personal development. Now we're all taught to go to school, get a career and make money, but we're not taught how to manage this money. That's why today we are here to talk about all things money matters with Financial Bunny, Nicolette Mashile and from Finn Savvy, Viwe Kotelwa. Thank you guys for joining me today. Thank Thanks for having us. <laughs> I am so excited for myself as well to learn about how I can better manage my finances. Now before we jump into the conversation, just to get to know you as a person, and I think I'll start here with Nicolette, what are some of the values that shaped you to be the woman that you are today and how did you become the financial bunny? Sure, that's a very large question. <laughs> <laughs> what are the values? Um, yeah. When I was still, I think there's one specific incident that I always remember. So I'm from from Bushwick Ridge and the school we we're going to was in Nels Parade, right? So one of the things, so we'd wake up every every Sunday night, my dad was supposed to drive us to Nels Parade, which he never did, so he would drive us the Monday morning. But that meant we had to be walking up at like 3 a.m., right, to bath and get everything ready, get into the car, and we'd drive down to Nels Parade um, via White River, and there's this big compound and there's like a sulfuric smell in the air. Mm -hmm. And you would see people standing around waiting to get into the work and all of that. And my dad would always say to us, if you don't go to school, your choices get limited. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's always been one of my biggest values is to be in the know, is mm -hmm. to get educated. Um, yes, people have found their journeys without education, but I guess maybe if we start maybe dismantling this idea of education and simply calling it information, access to information, I think when you have access to information, it kind of opens up your doors quite a little bit more. Yeah. It gives you more choices. You've got decisions that you can make, informed decisions, you know. So I'm quite anchored in education. And it's so funny because when my dad dropped me off at Rhodes University a couple of years ago, I'm going to tell you when. <laughs> Don't expose my age. When my dad dropped me off at Rhodes University, one of the things he said is, I'm not sending you to this school. First and foremost, I probably cannot afford the school, but I'm not sending you here to become a better Nicolette, better than everybody else. I'm sending you here to come gather information and bring it to people that do not have the privilege to be able to get such information. So I think information has always been at the center of our core values. Yeah. Wow, that is so powerful and I resonate so much with that because the whole reason why we're here today is to actually give people more access to information because not everybody has access Absolutely. and like you're saying, it's not just about the education, it's about having that access so that you can make those informed decisions. Absolutely. <laughs> and you, Viwe, um, how about your journey to Finn Savvy and just the values that shape the man that you are today? Um, okay, first, thanks for having us. Um, secondly, about me. Uh, uh, listen, I come from a home with six kids. Mm. Um, my mom was a teacher, dad's a doctor. But, you know, as I grew up, I was always just someone who was like very disciplined. Um, I don't know why it happened like that. It just it just turned out like that because, um, you know, there's, there's a weird story my mom always tells. She's like, there's a time when they had to bring home the car from like the dealership and the, I had to open the garage, and, but I was four. So what I did is I went outside and I was like, is the car far enough from the garage to open? Oh, wow. And everyone in the house was like, what is this four year old knowing <laughs> that this car could, could get hit, you know? But like that, that was always like, that's just how I grew up. That was always how I was, I was always responsible. Mm -hmm. And finances really became a thing for me after an entrepreneurial day that we had in grade three. And I started to learn about money and profit and loss and all these things, mm -hmm. like, oh, this is nice. So now obviously I come from a big family. So what did I do? I, like, mm, I want to make more money. 
So I started selling sweets to like my siblings, people in the house, we had helpers and stuff like yeah. that. So there was a time when I was like, I actually want a bike. So my mom was like, okay, cool, you started selling sweets. If you can raise this amount of money, we'll, we will uh, give you the other half. So okay, cool, that's an incentive. So I did that. And then from there, it just snowballed into this thing of why I'm so interested in money, yeah. why I was good at handling money as I grew up. And, you know, obviously I come from a home where, you know, very good values. My mom did a really good job of us, so I'll give her that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, man, it, it was, mom. yeah, shout out to her. <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, that's, that, that, that's just how I was. You know, I'm always, I, I'm a very responsible person. I, I like to be in control of exactly what's going on, mm. you know. Um, not that it's an obsessive or compulsive or anything, but I think it's good to just be, have a good hand in what is going to happen in front of you. Yeah. So that has really, you know, shaped how I've become. That's why I went into doing fin survey because I realized that the work that I want to do, I may not be able to do it if I go into corporate, you know, which yeah. is getting information out there about finances and all that stuff. So uh, I, took that, I took the leap and I was like, you know what, I was a subordinate in my last year, I saved up a bit of money. Let me just try and see what I can do. If I can't do it, I have a good degree to fall back on. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the things that has really shaped me and how I've become the, the person that I am today and hopefully the person that I continue to be going into the future. So yeah, I think that's about me. That is so cool. I love how you shared about how when you were young, you were really new in grade three that you were interested in how you're going to manage your finance. And I was actually going to ask, as a young person, how did you actually start building those habits? Is it through a piggy bank? Because I remember I had a piggy bank, that's how I first started learning about saving. Um, maybe for you it was, you know, that journey that you mentioned in grade three through school. What about you, Nicolette? What was the... Zero. When you were young? Nothing. Zero, my sister. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we had the consciousness of money management when I was growing up. I mean, at some point, my friends and I ran a tuck shop in in a course haze, but it was not. It was never necessarily about wanting to make more money or whatever. I feel like we were more. It was an act of service, you know, to our fellow hostel mates. Mm. It was never a money thing. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think I got slapped by money mistakes when I first tried to buy a house. That was the first biggest slap I got, and I was like, "Hey, what's happening?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you're just like, I'm so educated, you know, um, in a formal manner. Yeah. You've gone to school, you've gotten the degree, um, you've worked, you work a real job, you get money. And then the day you decide to actually make a financial decision that has such huge implications on your life, because you're going into a real credit agreement, you start to realize that, as in, I actually don't know what's going on here. Mm. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's very colluded with, with, with contractual law, with consumer rights. We realize for the first time in our lives, especially when we're making many decisions, that I actually don't know what my consumer rights are. As a person, let's just be fair. You know, many of us don't know. I mean, inside your, 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 your offer to purchase, for instance, you're getting in di these different clauses. There's a cooling off clause, there's a suspensive clause, and you sit in there and you're like, where do I start? So I, I don't ever remember being taught about money. I think, and, and here's, the, here's the thing, right, that makes it sometimes a little bit confusing. If you take money and you put it here, and you take real life and you put it here, these two things are actually complementary of each other. Your life lessons that you learn are, are actually your money lessons. But because we try to subtract and we want to take money out and put it on the side and say, oh, but so I think throughout the lessons my parents taught me, I mean, I, I ended up in, 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 in um, boarding school at the tender age of, uh, I think when I was nine, because mm -hmm. eight I was staying in a flat, yes, and nine we moved into boarding school. So that independence, that being able to take care of yourself, yeah. your parents giving you pocket money and saying it must last throughout the week or two weeks, Essentially, they, they're indirectly teaching you the discipline that you need to have, you know, so I think yeah. it's very pertinent that we don't make the money lessons and then, yes, there's money education, but a lot of the stuff that you do will, it will filter, will sit by your money. Mm. If you don't want money, you ain't disciplined, we know. <laughs> You know, so it, it, it filters through, yeah. I promise you it really yeah. does. Mm. Yeah. You spoke um, about how you got that wake up call of your life when hey. you're trying to make a big purchase. What are some of the common mistakes that most young people make in their 20s when it comes to their money? If you could summarize it. For me, okay. Um, salary rich. I think young people live salary rich. You see, there's a difference between, 
having money, right? Getting your salary. Let's, say, let's make an example. You have 15,000 rand every single month. Now you're young, first time working, and you don't have many obligations, right? So you only, let's say, you need to stay at home. Let's say from 15,000 rand, realistically, you will only use maybe, what, 7,000 rand. Which means you've got a balance, right? Yeah. The problem is that if you don't start using the good habits at that point in your life, what you're going to do is you're going to lifestyle your way to using 15,000 rand. Mm. Yes. The problem is then that you have to move out because now everybody at home bores you, know? You know, why are they in my things? Why are they in my, you know, I need to move out, I need to move out, I need to buy a house, I need to rent. And then you go into rent. And all of a sudden now 6,000, 7,000 rand is gone. But you've lived to the 15,000 rand through your lifestyle of when you didn't have any of those obligations. Now, what do you do? Credit cards. So a lot of us, what do we do? We jump into credit agreements, we're taking overdrafts, we're taking loans. So you start the debt cycle as soon as you know you start to feel the pinch. So that's one. Two, budgeting. Budgeting is simply, it is simply telling you, this is your money, this is where your money is going. A lot of people have a very snug relationship with budgeting because they make it too strict, they make it too idealistic. Your budget is probably like your diary, right? It's like where you go back and you say, ah, yeah, well, this month I've got more month than money. I need to make plans, right? And it's important to do that because a budget tracks what you do with your finances. Yeah. Very, very important. I think the last thing is really taking advantage of compound interest. You are probably are never going to be in a better situation if you're young to take advantage of compound interest. There's that example that um, I think it's Darren, Darren Hurdy? Darren, oh, don't quote me on this one. There's a guy who wrote The Compounding Effect, that book. And he makes a very, very interesting example at the beginning a simple example it says if i were to give you five million rand today mm. or i give you one rand that doubles every day okay obviously it's in dollar thing i'm just now i want to localize it yeah. five million rand today or i give you one rand that doubles every single day for the next 30 days which one do you take and obviously naturally a lot of us and, and let's be fair we have a frank conversation most people say we want to take the five million yeah. or oh, i can double five million rand. people also think that they can double you're lying you're lying Take the one rent, it's more disciplined. And at day 10, you haven't even cracked even one, a, a thousand rand. So it's that discipline of understanding compound interest and allowing it to do its job. Yeah. And the earlier you take it up, the better. Yeah, so it's yeah. so much more about the habits than actually just Definitely. having more money. Because without yeah. the discipline, like you mentioned, there is no, you're not no, able yeah. to accumulate that money. Agree. Yeah. Now, what are some of the anxieties, financial anxieties that triggered you to starting Finn Savvy? Um, do you mean for myself or like just stuff that I've seen? Yeah, for, for yourself people? and what you've seen. Um, financial anxiety, what can I say? Listen up. <laughs> <laughs> There's, everyone is looking for financial accountability. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that I really want to talk about, especially like just in society of, yeah. you know, people have all these things of I want to be a millionaire, I want to be a billionaire. Yeah. It's like, just find out what is comfortable for you mm. and just aim for that. That is the best thing you can do for yourself. Because if you start saying, no, I want to, have 10 million on now you're going to get into a cycle where you you might start doing things that you shouldn't be doing yeah. to get to that 10 million but i think financial anxieties is like you know you want to take care of yourself um you want to be in charge of what you do with your finances you you want to be able to not have that feeling during the month where you're like i can't afford that yeah. um but you know it's it's important to get a, a hang of your your finances like nicolette was saying in terms of like budgeting budgeting is yeah. so important like she said it's your diary you just have to do it, you know, find out what is your disposable income. Because if yeah. you can't, if you don't know what your disposable income is, mm. you're definitely going to jump into credit cards, you're going to jump into loans, you're going to jump into learning from friends, you're yeah. going to pay back friends, now yeah. you're a threat on Twitter, you yeah. know, all these things. Yeah. You know, you don't want those situations. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's important for people to get a hang of their finances as early as possible uh, so that you don't have to be making decisions as a result of a situation that you came out of. Yeah. Of course, some people learn by lesson. It's unfortunate, it happens. Mm -hmm. You hope that they learn those lessons, mm -hmm. but some don't. Um, but I think, you know, it's that situation of, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. True. So it's best that you actually get a hang of your finances so you don't have to suffer those financial anxieties. Um, so with Thin Survey, that's really why I'm doing the work that I'm doing because, you know, uh, you know as she said, it, it, it's about habits. But I also think that there's a side to it where what you grew up seeing has a lot to do with how you manage money. Yeah. And that's another big thing for me because a very good example of the 15,000 men that you get used to it. A lot of, remember, 97% of our, our country comes from backgrounds that earn 7,000 men or less per month. Yeah. The reality in those situations is that it's hand to mouth. So what do you see as a child as you're growing up? Hand to mouth, mm -hmm. hand to mouth, wakomani, there's no money, you yeah. know, all those things. That's, that's a big... Uh, 
influence on a child because when you're a kid, you're, you're a sponge, you soak up all those things. So now when you get your first job, it's like, well, 15,000, I'm gonna finish that in a month, I'm gonna get another 15,000. But because now you never had that thing that you grew up in, in an environment where you can save, where they discuss taxes and investments yes. at the table. Yes. And unfortunately, as a result of the majority of our country coming from those backgrounds where it's just hand to mouth, yeah. that's why we continue to see people continuing to make those situations where they're having financial anxieties. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that's why I want to do the work that I want to do. Mm -hmm. Get to those communities who won't come from the backgrounds where investments and taxes and all those things are discussed at the table when you're young and get them that information because the most important thing is and i always say this the information behind uh, managing your finances is much more important than you having the money to manage the finances mm -hmm. because i think even like it doesn't matter who you are if you're a person maybe you live hand to mouth now it's very important that you give your kids that information of how to handle money, even if they don't have it yet. Mm -hmm. Because if they get to that age and now, you know, all they knew was the same lifestyle that you created for them. I mean, not what you created for them, but the lifestyle that you had as a result of your earning capacity. It's just a cycle continues yeah. and you don't want that. So the information is more important because you must have that information before you get the money. Because yeah. then you won't end up in the 15,000 situation where you finish it in the month. Yeah. Can I add something to what you said? It's not even just only about how you grew up and what your influences are. It's also trauma. People, they respond to their trauma now, or like, you know, trauma that happened in their childhood, they bring it into their finances in their adult. I do a lot of personal finance coaching, and I, I promise you, I kid you not, first 15 minutes, they're crying, people are crying because there's financial guilt from family members. Mm -hmm. There is shame. Yeah. People can't take back cars that they can't afford anymore because what will my friends say, mm -hmm. you know? Where you can feel that you are drowning, but because of certain traumas, a scarcity is a huge trauma. Yeah. You know, people can't even invest because they have to see their money here. Mm -hmm. I remember seen in a club where people will open their bank apps and show you their balances because it makes them feel good, yeah. you know? So, so things like that, I always say behavioral finance is key and in actual fact, in a country like South Africa, that's where we should start. Yeah. Before we even start dealing, I mean, yes, education is important, and parallel to dealing with the psychological effects of not having is very big. You know, you, we see it with a lot of um, uh, 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 relationships, partners, where one partner who has the most money kind of has the upper hand. So I think it's very key that we start getting people to understand who they are as a person so that they can actually start explaining why they behave a certain way when the money is around because yeah. it will crack open so much more for yeah. you. Yeah, and that okay. touches on the, the relationship with money and Absolutely. a lot of people don't have a healthy relationship with money. How do we get more people to actually acknowledge firstly that there is that trauma um, and how do we then help them to you know, fix that relationship and actually be able to you know, manage your finances accordingly? You know, Davi, I get asked this question uh, a lot in, um, in, in, in seminars where people will say, do you love yourself? I'm like, what do you mean? What does loving myself look like? You know what I mean? And, and I almost give it the same sentiment as when we say, do people have a good, what does a good relationship with money look like? Mm -hmm. Ideally, mm -hmm. we need to sh first shape the, what it's supposed to look like mm -hmm. so that we can teach people what it is that they're supposed to do, right? Yeah. And I think it starts off with you being comfortable with yourself. If you are comfortable with Ndavi, you are not buying branded labels to try and put on a, a, a status symbol, right? You are not going to go into a dealership and they tell you, you can't afford this car, but you can afford it with a balloon payment. There you know a balloon payment is not good for you. Yeah. But because, yay, yeah, they said I must come out of Rapa, in South Africa, I cannot drive an A to B. Do you get what I'm saying? So it's, it's really about having that emotional, and, uh, emotional intelligence added to financial emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's when we can truly say you've got a great relationship with money. When you can handle your emotions and they're not driving mm -hmm. some of the decisions. Mm -hmm. my, 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 she's a social worker slash psychologist. Tuli always says, you've got Nicolette who sits in the front and you've got Coco who sits at the back. And when somebody triggers your value system, mm -hmm. if some, for instance, my biggest value, you'll see even on my YouTube channel, whenever I'm venting, it's because someone has disrespected me, they've undermined me, those things, those, what is it, disrespect and undermine makes me feel like, Coco comes out, you know, and Coco starts me. I will go and buy 50 Range Rovers because you've undermined mm -hmm. Nicolette in the fund, and Coco is now making decisions. Yeah. But Coco is, is animalistic. Mm -hmm. Coco works on instinct. Coco works on my manuscripts that were written when I was still a child. 
Nicolette, on the other hand, is the education. Yeah. She understands. So you can't just go and buy a Range Rover because Undavi has disrespected you. You know. Yeah. So it, that those are the two characters in your head, yeah. and they actually just come down to emotion. Yeah. So the biggest thing you've got to do is to get that financial emotion intelligence, yeah. so that you can use it as a weapon to be able to make. You should be able to walk away when somebody says. I when they let win, I must pay for you because we know you never you never have money. You're like, you know what guys, it's actually fine, let me go to let me go to my house. Mm. Fear of missing out. It comes from lack of financial intelligence, the financial yeah. emotional intelligence. Because you should be sitting at home and chilling and saying, My blueprint says I'm going to put down a deposit at the end of the year for a house. Therefore I cannot frivolously be going to parties where they invite me and I must pay for my own meal. There's no way. Give me a free meal, then I'll come. But if you say I'm paying for my own meal, I'm sorry, my money's all channels to this down. Yeah. You know, so it's things like that for yeah. us to be able to develop that yeah. relationship. Yeah. There's a lot of discipline around money. A Absolutely. A lot of discipline. And I noticed she spoke about a balloon payment, and because I studied finance, it's something I taught, right? But we spoke about this um, lightly before we started the interview about there being the jargon in, you know, in finance that a lot of people actually don't know. Even if they're an engineer, mm -hmm. a doctor, there's still a sense of not knowing how to speak around finance. Um, how do we bring that barrier to, to information for people who are educated as well? Look, for me, as, as I was saying to you at the beginning, um, it's so important when you're bringing stuff like financial information to people that you bring it to them in the most basic package. Because the problem is, you start going into jargon, people are going to switch off after three minutes. Mm. If I start telling you 32 day call accounts and uh, what's something else that's interesting in, if I start telling you about the FDIC in America, people are going to be like, I don't want to hear about that. I want to know about how do I manage my money. Mm -hmm. So if you start from a simplistic basis, like for example, uh, with the book that I put together about taxes, start right from the beginning. What's money? Okay, do you have a good handle of what money is? Okay, cool. Let's go to the next one. Or, or, what is taxes? Or do you know what taxes are? Mm -hmm. Do you know what taxes are useful? That's how you start building up people's knowledge. And you have to do things really slowly with people because as she said, a lot of people have a lot of um, uh, you know, anxieties towards finances. So mm -hmm. when you start talking to them about their finances, mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't want to talk about this. Yeah. And now, now you can't continue the conversation. But if you start them slowly, you know, get things into people early as well. Like whether it's school, whether it's university, whether it's the workplace. Yeah. I think all of it should be the same because the reality is it doesn't matter what you do in this life. You are going to be managing money. Yeah. If you're working, you're getting paid a salary, you're managing money. Yeah. If you're not working, you're getting a grant. What are you doing? You're managing money. Yeah. You, everyone is paying taxes. VAT, you pay that in the store. If you're working and you, and you can't get tax, you're getting tax. So, you can't run away from money issues no matter who you are and that's why I think it's so important that you bring those things in early to people and that's why I'm a very big advocate about getting information about finances to kids like once you start getting a handle of numbers um, some words which can be understandable at a lower level get that information into them even if it's a two-page you know pamphlet put a bit of a test on them let's see if they understand it move on to the next stage yeah. because the biggest thing for me is I think you really should give them this information as early as possible and let it sink in because as I said you know as a child you're a sponge you know get that stuff into them very early I think that's one of the reasons as I mentioned before I think that's one of the reasons why I um, have a, a decent handle on understanding finances you know like I got into it when I was very young yeah. so as you get older it's like oh okay that's that's interesting that's interesting so it's not it's not it's not a it's not a subject that's intimidating when it comes to finance, yeah. I'm very comfortable with it, and in fact, that's why I did the degree I did. Yeah. Um, so I think it's it's just very important to, to bring that information to people at such a basic standpoint where they're not feeling intimidated by the information that's being put in front of them. And then from there, you'll see people will snowball and really understand exactly what's going on. And you know, I think it's just about having that thing that's being given to people so that they have it. Because what's happening right now is no one is getting given that information. Mm. Everyone is just being oh, go to school, okay, go out there. Like, like she said, now you're buying a house. I don't know what's going on yeah. here. Uh, interest rates, basis points. People will buy a house and go, oh, basis points has nothing to do with me. Yes, it does. You're paying a bond. You didn't do, you didn't do a fixed rate interest rate. It's going to affect you. So I think that's really important for people to get that information right from a basic standpoint very early. And I think you'll see a really good, um, uh, what's this thing? You'll see a really good result from that because the reality is yeah. uh, people who are more financially, I mean, sorry, a society that is more financially informed actually contributes to economic growth. Like yeah. they've done studies about this multiple times. It's a wonder why yeah. we don't include it into education, but that's a story for another day. Yeah, that's so true. I think we need to get your book out there actually to more schools and more people so that they start with the basics. Because as much as we do the this is what you're supposed to do, this is the book I was telling him, I did accounting. 
but I needed to go back again when I actually physically needed to do it to know the terms that, like, what does this mean? What does this mean for me in reality? How does it affect me? And that's how finances actually work. They affect us every day, um, but we actually don't know the terms and we don't know how to word it. Um, but we are running out of time, so I'm going to ask you both to give me your final remarks on if someone can implement something right now that will help them with their financial goals and going forward, what would you say to someone? Budget. Mm. I don't think there's any starting point better than budgeting. Mm -hmm. A budget is a blueprint. It gives you a clear indication of whether you're going to make it through the month or not. Do I need to bake more cake or eat less cake? I mean, I am a big advocate of baking more cake, um, but I understand in a country like South Africa where we still need to reteach how to be disciplined with your money, there are instances where we need to get people to eat less cake, right? Um, and I think the budget will tell you how big your piece of cake is that's left. And remember, it's quite important to remember that with your budget, you need to create that disposable income that allows you to actually put together financial planning. So that's a funny thing that people don't understand. Financial planning is born out of good money management. If you don't manage your money well, you can't do financial planning. Why? Because you don't have a disposable income to pay towards your retirement. You've got no disposable income to pay towards your risk mitigation, whether it's a life insurance, income protector, car insurance. So all of those fancy insurances that are going to be really needed when an incident happens in your life that you need, if you don't have that space for them in your budget to pay for them, you're basically running around in circles. Like you're literally in, I know the rat race speaks to, to, to corporate and career, but you're literally in a money rat race because this is all you're going to be doing. So I, I think that, I don't think I could ever give anybody a better, if you don't budget, the rest. <laughs> Let's just leave it because you don't want, you're not compliant. <laughs> That's my thing, yeah. <laughs> But from your end, yeah, no, I, budget and I, I think budgeting is very important. Um, but you know, also, we've been speaking about it the whole time, you know, getting yourself more informed. I think, you know, especially like for me, from what I'm seeing now, I think, especially with young women as well, look, young men mustn't think we're not prioritizing them, they've always been prioritized. I think it's also very important that we also get this information in front of young women as well because you know the, the numbers speak for themselves. I think 42 to 46 percent of households in South Africa are headed by women, and the reality is even in the houses that are probably headed by men, the women are actually the ones who are managing the finances. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important, uh, you know, to get that information in front of them because you know we, we sit with these statistics, and we're not saying that history is going to repeat itself, but they always say history doesn't repeat itself; it rhymes. And unfortunately, considering the economic situation that we're in right now it's most likely that the, the history is going to rhyme. I mean, the future is going to rhyme with the past. So, um, number one, starting with the budget. But I think, you know, having that intention and information, your uh, intention to want to go and find out more information. I should say, if you don't have uh, disposable income, you're not going to have disposable income to manage. So, yeah. budgeting is the first point. And then from there, get the information behind you. And, you know, you can find people who are interested to do this stuff. I mean, I'm interested to do this stuff. She's interested to do this stuff. We, we, we try and open people's <laughs> eyes. <laughs> we try and open people's eyes to understanding more about finances, you know. Um, just an example with what I'm doing. Um, I, I, I met my cousin's friend last year who asked me what I did and I told her what I did with the book. And she was like, I wish I'd read your book before because I'm currently sitting with a 500,000 Rand VAT debt because mm -hmm. the accountant that I used was not being honest with everything with me. And she was like, if I had your book, if I had known this, I could have picked up on all these little things. Mm -hmm. So that speaks to the fact that information is so important because, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately we do live in a world where even professionals are looking to not have your best interest. So budgeting, but also get that information behind you because if you can just at least be able to analyze a balance sheet, just in jail, basic, uh, you'll be good. <laughs> you'll be good. Well, anyway, Nicolette, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm sure you guys are sitting there with your budget right now. If you didn't have one, you should start in this moment. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let us know what you enjoyed the most about this episode, and then we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.